the, uh, I've spent most of my adult life uh, working in a small community, my community at Ardoc, Ardoc Algonquin First Nation, um, protecting the environment, uh, helping develop community, restoring some of our traditional ways. Uh, and that whole process has been a taxing lifestyle for me. It's meant that uh, at times I lost my job. Uh, at other times uh, I was arrested, uh, spent time in prison. Um, being a First Nations person in Canada can be a, a hazardous occupation. <laughs> and I'm sure that's true in, uh, in the United States as well. Um, it's also given me lots of opportunities. It meant that I would uh, not only get to know my own community intimately, but also that uh, people in the wider world, I would get to know them and they would get to know me a little bit more. And eventually it led me to the academy. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's, it, it forced me to think about solving problems rather than just recognizing uh, the problems. So what I'm going to present today is a uh, is a is really a, a, a set of understandings, a set of uh, uh, understandings that came out of some research that I've been doing. And I also want to say that I've I'm this message is is for everybody in the room. It's not just for indigenous the indigenous people in this room. It's not just. Uh, for the settlers in this room. <coughs> this message is about all of us. It's about all of our histories uh, and where those histories began, where they've led us, and where the, where, where the possible futures might lie for us together. Uh, because gosh, guess what? We're here. We're here and now. And uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna change that fact, but what we can do is change the possible futures that uh, that we face. It's a lovely painting by my wife, by the way, and it always reminds us that the watershed in the winter time uh, is snow, and that uh, that snow does that water does something in the winter time. It covers the earth, it quiets it down, it lets it renew, it restores it, and uh, sometimes that's uh, that's the that's a really fine use of, of water. And then it melts in the springtime, and it's the clear water that the fish swim up to, and they, they spawn in that clear water uh, in the springtime. So, you know, water is a process. And so I've learned something about the world around us, is that it's structural, it's a structural process, and that all of the things that we deal with uh, are structural processes. And so I, uh, that's, that's really something that, that has informed my research. So I call this the architecture of a decolonized society, re-indigenize the self, community, and the environment. It wasn't too long ago that the settler populations that went through a huge diaspora from Western Europe uh, and many other places in the world and ended up in North America, it wasn't too long ago that they lived loved lives much like our ancestors six, seven, eight hundred thousand, fifteen hundred years ago in North, who lived their, their lives in North America. They were much like us. Uh, and some things happened. They became Romanized, they lost their languages, uh, they lost their spirituality, uh, they, they, were, they lost their, their sense of self-governance, and their economies collapsed and were replaced by mercantile and, and, uh, and slave economies. So we all have a process of decolonization that we have to go through in order to achieve our goals. The, uh, you know, I think about this, where do, where do you start? Do you go back 2,000 years? Do you go back 3,000 years and see where the impetus for this started? Well, I don't think we need to do that. For me, I, you know, pick out an arbitrary date like 1667 when John Milton publishes Paradise Lost and really instills in us that getting out of the garden, being forced out of the garden, being forced out of our contact and our real relationship with the world, um, you know, I mean, when Satan is thrown out of heaven, where is Satan thrown to? He's thrown down to the earth, and Milton talks about it as a black, desolate place. Well, we don't live in a black, desolate place. We live in a really beautiful world. You know, this is a, you know, of all possible worlds that we could have 
been born into in this in this uh, entire galaxy, uh, we've got it made. <laughs> so you know, we keep that in mind uh, that John Milton was absolutely wrong. <laughs> but other philosophers pick this up, and even economists like. Uh, uh, excuse me, my mind here, uh, by, by John Locke. And John Locke picks up this idea and he says, you know what, um, natural society, or natural world is bleak, it's desolate, it's, it's not very good. Uh, and the way that people live in a primitive state is no good because everything, you know, belongs to them. They really can't own anything and therefore they can't generate any wealth. So there's no progress and no advancement and no return to the old, idea of, of this, this beautiful creation that, that God has for us. He also brings in ideas of private property, uh, the creation of wealth, how to manage monetary systems, and those are the very beginnings of, a, of a, at least an apology for colonialism. Um, and even philosophers um, like uh, uh, Immanuel Kant at that time wrote this. He said, you know what, we can't, and I'll, I'll, I'll basically re read it from the script. Um, uh, it is never uh, made clear how biologically inferior endowments of non-whites uh, could be consistent with this destiny. And he's talking about the destiny of process. So what goes into colonialism is also this idea of racism. And so we have a, an emerging and very powerful group of uh, money managers and property managers uh, telling us that we're inferior, telling Asians that they're inferior, telling you know, the, the laboring classes of Europe that they're inferior uh, because, because they're a little bit more tan than everybody else because they spend more time outside. You know, this whole idea of color of skin becomes a huge, huge uh, issue and you know charity reminded us last night of this is this 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 struggle to reclaim our indigeneity this struggle to reclaim our relationship with the earth is about racism too it's about that type of of, of denial of human rights and civil rights uh, that's been going on been carried on in this country and certainly uh, other countries for a long time so we find ourselves in a world in which money becomes the, uh, uh, one of the, the, the principal vehicles for wealth and one of the principal understandings of the value and worth of people. We're also stuck with this, and this is, I found one of the most difficult problems uh, that we face is that as Canada was colonized, or, and as, as the United States was colonized, it was divided up into political zones, states and provinces. And so we have this picture. And the present governance structures, they really don't conform to the environment. Um, or the, our conditions or ecosystem realities. For the most part, the political boundaries were created uh, for a system of colonial settlement, resource extraction and industrial manufacture while denaturing systems, ecosystems and limiting environmentally appropriate government. So was there ever appropriate environmental government in, um, in North America? This is a, a map from Olive Dickinson's history of, of um, Aboriginal people in Canada. And when you look at this map, it's a map of languages. It took a number of documents and ciphered through them to understand where the major indigenous languages were located in North America around the time of contact with Europeans. But when you look at this map, and, and remember this, is that languages are the signature of culture. They're what expresses the ideas, the aspirations, the dreams, the laws, the social relationships, that's what our languages do for us. When you look at this map, what do you also see? You see a cultural uh, congruence with the major ecosystems of North America. 
So what we see here is that before European settlement, before colonization and before capitalism entered into our environment, our cultures which embodied our government, government, our epistemologies, our ways of thinking, our governances, uh, conformed in large measure to the ecosystems which were already here. And if you were to break this down into smaller dialects or, uh, or some of the, 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 uh, uh, the lesser known languages, you would find those also located in distinct ecosystems, in particular watersheds in, I, associated with the major watersheds. So what does that tell us about one of the hurdles that we have to get over in terms of governance in restoring an ecological balance? tells us that as, as Canadians and uh, U.S. citizens and Mexicans as well, that we've got to reconfigure where our governance systems have authority and appropriate authority. Indigenous cultures emerge as human knowledge systems based on rational experience, uh, relational experience with multiple generations and their acquired knowledge, their traditional knowledge. Uh, yesterday, we, when we were talking about the agreements, we, uh, we spoke a little bit about the appropriateness of, of defining knowledge. And, and this is, is also one of the aspects that, that came through my experience with my community, um, but also um, through my research, is that indigenous cultures are knowledge-based cultures. They're not material-based cultures, and so there's some issues I want to talk about a little bit later, but this is really, really important. Just give you a really good example of that. In the Ottawa Valley, among the uh, Anishinaabe people of the Ottawa Valley, the Omaha Winnie, we have the use or the knowledge of 240 different plants annually for food. Think about that. Think about how many plants you might have in your fridge at any one time and count the, you know, what's in the freezer and count all of the, what's in the condiments. You might come up with about 30, if you're lucky. We had the knowledge of 240 different plants that could be used through the year, where they were found. So what this tells us, and I mean, this is just an example. This tells us that our cultures and knowing our language were really deep in knowledge, extensive knowledge systems of the land. Um, indigenous cultures epistemo are epistemologically driven, and they're determined and reinforced knowledge acquired through interaction with a complex energetic environment. Knowledge is gained through observation and introspection. A person understands their connectedness to the creation. When you possess this type of knowledge base, this is what indigenous society is. As we begin to de define what indigeneity is, it's not what's in your blood, although that might be a marker. It's the lifestyle, it's the culture in which you adapt to and are born into and acquire over the, the time of your life through acquiring knowledge and introspection. And indigenous knowledge systems are complex reflections of empirical local experience, rational discovery, symbolic imagery, and social reinforcement. Local experience, uh, I think, is, is perhaps uh, really, really important to recognize here, is that if we know something about our local area, we know a lot more than if we know a lot about all sorts of stuff out there that we never touch and we have no influence over. Local adaptation, local acquisition of knowledge is really about what human knowledge is really about. Original instructions, knowledge of, uh, of original instructions is the union of perception, symbolism, belief, and understanding. It begins with innate knowledge and is interpreted through symbolic expression and tested empirically through practice. And so we know it. We see grandma and grandpa dancing and singing it, and then we go out and do it. And that way we build this introspe or this, this understanding of what uh, our original instructions are. And then there's also Mother Earth knowledge that ind indigenous people uh, possess. The, uh, the knowledge of the shape of power and life. The shape of power and life is not rectangle. It is not in the shape of a $50 bill. 
it is in the shape of round. Everything that lives, the drop of water, the rain that falls, the tree, the bird nest, all of those things that uh, we know that have the power of life are round. And, uh, and that, that's what we call Mother Earth knowledge because that's what we learn from the experience of interacting with the Mother Earth. Uh, uh, and also just the, the process of life, that everything rests upon the stone. And that all of the plants need to rest upon that stone. Without the stone, there would be no plants. Without the plants, there would be no animals. And all of the animals rest upon that, uh, those plants. And then lastly, the human beings. We depend upon all those. And we are the most dependent of all creatures in this world. And so that's the, that's the knowledge that we gain simply by looking at the earth. And that gives us an orientation of what living well is all about. These things are tremendously valuable to what it is to be human. Indigenous people work, basically, our indigenous economies work on, on these two principles. And they work it because they observe these two principles. Uh, never consume more nutrient matter than can be restored through the replenishment cycle in a particular ecosystem. And if you're into sentential calculus, there's the, uh, there's the equation. Never expand more energy than what can be replaced by what you consume. That's really important. So when I took the, uh, my wife and I took the airplane here uh, to Indiana, we actually consumed a hell of a lot more energy uh, than what we, uh, what, we, what we can ever really replace. So how do you mitigate these two and make them work within your interaction with the environment? You develop cultural knowledge that's expressed through art and poetry and song and dance, and you embody them uh, you embody this economy into your social and, and sort of personal psychology. And, you know, that's why it's really important to see the artists here too. <coughs> so extractive slave settler colonialism have resulted in human population problems that are demanding uh, a movement toward re-indigenizing the commons. Um, John Locke, Although he had very, very strong theories, his theories had fallacies. He could not predict the outcome of externalizing the cost of production uh, onto human uh, labor, through slave labor or wage labor. He couldn't imagine um, how settler populations would displace indigenous knowledge systems with populations that had no knowledge of how the world works or how the earth works and where they live, putting those settler populations at tremendous peril of, over, of, of never meeting those, those equations, not being able to, uh, uh, to live lives that were sustainable because they were moved off the areas, the lands where they were sustainable. Um, present social and economic environment analysis projects that that synthesized cultures, um, like the Western economies, um, created by colonialism and capitalism, are reaching a tipping point where they can no longer maintain balance. And frankly, you have to know this, is that one of the major studies in the academy today and universities today is what the hell we're going to do in the next 10 to 50 years, because we really are at this tipping, ba uh, tipping point. Um, the three principal ideas are that we're going to encounter uh, fortress capitalism. That's already underway. Uh, recently, Honduras passed a, a constitutional amendment which allows them to establish uh, with international partners like Canada uh, the ability to uh, construct uh, Region Especial de Desarrollo, which are special development zones where people will be protected as li wage laborers. Um, their children will be promised a, a modicum of health care and education, and they will be protected by militaries like the Canadian military in order to engage in industrial capitalism for Canadian companies located in Honduras. That's what fortress capitalism is. Uh, already underway. 
and uh, I hope those lawyers and, pe and people who, kn who know the law, you know, can speak a little bit about that. Um, and the other is social breakdown that we will encounter. We will dissolve into a, a sort of a, a new barbarianism. Uh, what the bomb couldn't do, uh, we will have done to ourselves. And the other uh, scenario is bending the curve. And I guess that's what I want to talk about in terms of re-indigenization, is that we need to uh, resume our relationship with the earth. And in that, we will simply be bending the curve back. Remember that when John Locke began to stimulate uh, economic changes, which accelerated capitalism, he was bending the curve. Okay, his principles bent the curve. Now we need to bend the curve back. And uh, you also have to know in, in, in truth that the philosophies and the, under, and the research around bending the curve is that, you know, and the question is, what if you can't bend the curve fast enough? Okay. Well, that's what we're here to try to, uh, to figure out, how we can bend that curve as quickly as possible. Colonialism is a structural process. That means there's architecture to it, and you can understand it. If you can understand its, its form, and it's also a process. You can understand uh, how it moves through time and how it develops and evolves uh, because of that. Uh, that's probably why academics need to, uh, to work on these issues. So the, pro the solutions to these problems lie within social, cultural realm, along with po uh, political and technological. Te technology isn't going to solve it for us. Changing our politicians isn't going to change it for us. But changing ourselves, changing ourselves socially and culturally as a people of North America, as the peoples of North America, uh, that's probably the most effective way to bring about change. And so what I've done is, uh, and how are we doing, Anna, for time? I don't want to overdo it and take somebody else's time. Four more minutes. Four more minutes? OK. <coughs> what I've done in my research is I've taken a number of themes and tried to deconstruct them so that I understand uh, the power of indigeneity compared with the power uh, and, the, and the structural process uh, of capitalism. And so I look at language. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend my four minutes, I think, talking about language and how important language is. Indigenous languages tend to be verb-based because they're based primarily on a relationship with the functions of the earth. Uh, people tend to talk in subject predicates rather than labels. So things like the word oil doesn't tell us very much. But if I were to re-indigenize that word, uh, in the English language, I would say um, a, a fluidity that uh, runs my car and pollutes the air. So I'm, I'm using a verb, I'm, I'm using it in a verbal, verb sense to tell what it's doing, because that's far more important than just the label. And so one of the things that we have to do is we have to re relearn the languages we speak. I struggle with, with uh, indigenous language being taught in the university because I think that if students learn, learn our languages and all they talk about is what they bought at Walmart, then those languages aren't worth anything. They're only worth something when they're, taught, when they're used within the context in which they emerged. And that's, that's something that, that we all need to refocus on is, is learning to talk again, learning to talk in process. Um, I want to just skip down to militarism too, um, because I think that's also uh, something that I wanted to uh, talk about. This, this PowerPoint, by the way, is on the wiki, so if you want to go to it, uh, it's there. Uh, this is an updated version. I'll update it on the wiki as well. Um, What's it going to take to, for us to change ourselves? Well, we have to change ourselves, and that means reinforcing our, our message, uh, convincing our neighbors that we need to sing and dance, tell stories about these things, and reinforce the knowledge within our local communities. But it also means we're going to have to defend ourselves um, and defend this, uh, this proposition. So you need to prepare yourselves and to, to prepare your children and grandchildren for a really long, uh, serious fight.
fight to change. Because those people who have power and wealth are not going to give it up. I, I didn't even say give it up easily, because that's, that's for taking. They are not going to give it up. And so we have to take it away from them. And so we need to engage in a struggle. I, and I think we can use some of the indigenous ways of doing that, of, of literally assuming our authority over the land, of exercising our, not only our rights, but our responsibilities. And I'm going to give you two good examples of this. Uh, if you go to the end of this PowerPoint, uh, you're going to find the principles of development that were developed by my own community, the Ardoch Algonquin First Nation. What we did is we have said, we're not going to put up with the uh, Canadian law about environment anymore. We're instituting our own principles of our relationship with the environment. In northern Ontario, the whole uh, chief and band council went to prison a month after I went to prison in defense of their land. And uh, they have recently uh, worked and developed what they call their, uh, their water declaration. Their, and and th because they, where, they, where they're located, and where you can see our land here, how much water is in our land, um, they're, they're water-based. They're a community that, that sees themselves as water-based as much as land-based. And so saying that this is their water declaration, their water declaration includes all of their territory and all of the tributaries that flow into their territory and where the water goes because they have relationships with the people where that water goes and they have relationships with the people who are their neighbors over the highlands where those waters begin. And that defines their territory and it defines their responsibility as a culture and as a people. And that's the kind of re-indigenizing thought that we need to think about and develop and actualize in our daily responsibilities and lives with each other. So thank you very much. And